Chapter 5, The Pandora, Part 2 of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of HMS Bounty, its cause and consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Haley Flagg. The eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of HMS Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Chapter 5. Part 2. It is an awful moment when a ship takes her last heel, just before going down. When the Pandora sunk, the surgeon says, the crew had just time to leap overboard, accompanying it with most dreadful yell. The cries of the men drowning in the water was at first awful in the extreme, but as they sunk and became faint, they died away by degrees. How accurately has Byron described the whole progress of a shipwreck to the final catastrophe, he might have been a spectator of the Pandora at the moment of her foundering, when she gave a heel and then a lurch to port, and, going down head foremost, sunk. Then rose from sea to sky the wild farewell, then shrieked the timid and stood still the brave. Then some leaped overboard with dreadful yell, as eager to anticipate their grave. And the sea yawned around her like a hell, and down she sucked with her the whirling wave, like one who grapples with his enemy, and strives to strangle him before he die. And first one universal shriek there rushed, louder than the loud ocean, like a crash of echoing thunder, and then all was hushed, save the wild wind and the remorseless dash of billows. But at intervals there gushed, accompanied with a convulsive splash, a solitary shriek, the bubbling cry of some strong swimmer in his agony. On the sandy quay which fortunately presented itself, the shipwrecked seamen hauled up the boats to repair those that were damaged, and to stretch canvas round the gunwales, the better to keep out the sea from breaking into them. The heat of the sun and the reflection from the sand are described as excruciating, and the thirst of the men was rendered intolerable, from their stomachs being filled with salt water in the length of time they had to swim before being picked up. Mr. Hamilton says they were greatly disturbed in the night by the irregular behavior of one of the seamen, named Connell, which made them suspect he had got drunk with some wine that had been saved. But it turned out that the excruciating torture he suffered from thirst had induced him to drink salt water, by which means he went mad and died in the sequel of the voyage. It seems a small keg of water and some biscuits had been thrown into one of the boats, which they found by calculation would be sufficient to last sixteen days, on an allowance of two wine glasses of water per day to each man, and a very small quantity of bread, the weight of which was accurately ascertained by a musket ball and a pair of wooden scales made for each boat. The crew and the prisoners were now distributed among the four boats. At Bly's mountainous island, they entered a bay where swarms of natives came down and made signs for their landing, but this they declined to do, on which an arrow was discharged and struck one of the boats, and as the savages were seen to be collecting their bows and arrows, a volley of muskets, a few of which happened to be in the boats, was discharged, which put them to flight. While sailing among the islands and near the shore, they now and then stopped to pick up a few oysters and procure a little fresh water. On the 2nd of December, they passed the northwest point of New Holland, and launched into the great Indian Ocean, having a voyage of about a thousand miles still to perform. It will be recollected that Captain Bly's people received warmth and comfort by wringing out their clothes in salt water. The same practice was adopted by the crews of the Pandora's boats, but the doctor observes that this wetting their bodies with salt water is not advisable, if protracted beyond three or four days, as, after that time, the great absorption from the skin that takes place taints the fluids with the bitter part of salt water, so that the saliva becomes intolerable in the mouth. Their mouths, indeed, he says, became so parched that few attempted to eat the slender allowance of bread. He also remarks that as the sufferings of the people continued, their temper became cross and savage. In the captain's boat, it is stated, one of the mutineers took to praying, but that the captain, suspecting the purity of his doctrines and unwilling that he should have a monopoly of the business, gave prayers himself. On the 13th, they saw the island of Timor, and the next morning landed and got some water, and a few small fish from the natives, and on the night of the 15th, anchored opposite the fort of Coupang. Nothing could exceed the kindness and hospitality of the governor and other Dutch officers of this settlement in affording every possible assistance and relief in their distressed condition. Having remained here three weeks, they embarked on the 6th of October on board the Rembang, Dutch Indiamen, 
and on the thirtieth anchored at Samarang, where they were agreeably surprised to find their little tender, which they had so long given up for lost. On the 7th of November they arrived at Batavia, where Captain Edwards agreed with the Dutch East India Company to divide the whole of the ship's company and prisoners among four of their ships proceeding to Europe. The latter the captain took with him in the Vredenburg. But finding his master ship Gorgon at the Cape, he transhipped himself and the prisoners and proceeded in her to Spithead, where he arrived on the 19th of June, 1792. Captain Edwards, in his meagre narrative, takes no more notice of his prisoners with regard to the mode in which they were disposed of at Coupang in Batavia than he does when the Pandora went down. In fact, he suppresses all information respecting them from the day in which they were consigned to Pandora's box. From this total indifference toward these unfortunate men, and their almost unparalleled sufferings, Captain Edwards must be set down as a man whose only feeling was to stick to the letter of his instructions, and rigidly to adhere to what he considered the strict line of his duty. That he was a man of a cold, phlegmatic disposition, whom no distress could move, and whose feelings were not easily disturbed by the sufferings of his fellow creatures. He appears to have been one of those mortals who might say, with Manfred, My spirit walked not with the souls of men. My joys, my griefs, my passions, and my powers made me a stranger, though I wore the form. I had no sympathy with breathing flesh. There seems to have been a general feeling at and before the court-martial that Captain Edwards had exercised a harsh, unnecessary, and undue degree of severity on his prisoners. It is the custom, sanctioned no doubt by long usage, to place in irons all such as may have been guilty of mutiny in a ship of war, and the necessity of so doing is obvious enough to prevent, in the most effectual manner, communication with the rest of the ship's company, who might be contaminated by their intercourse, with such mischievous and designing men, men whose crime is of that dye that, if found guilty, they have little hope to escape the punishment of death, to which a mutineer must, by the naval articles of war, be sentenced. No alternative being left to a court-martial in such a case but to pronounce a sentence of acquittal or of death. In the present case, however, most of the prisoners had surrendered themselves, many of them had taken no active part in the mutiny, and others had been forcibly compelled to remain in the ship. It was not likely, therefore, that any danger could arise from indulging them, occasionally and in turns, with a few hours of fresh air on deck. As little danger was there of their escaping, where indeed could they escape too, especially when the ship was going down at a great distance from any shore, and the nearest one known to be inhabited by savages. All or most of them were desirous of getting home and throwing themselves on God and their country. The captain, however, had no compunctious visitings of nature to shake his purpose which seems to have been to keep them strictly in irons during the whole passage and to deliver them over in that state on his arrival in England. Perhaps the circumstance of the crime of piracy being superadded to that of mutiny may have operated on his stern nature and induced him to inflict a greater severity of punishment than he might otherwise have done and which he certainly did far beyond the letter and spirit of his instructions. He might have considered that in all ages and among all nations, with the exception of some of the Greek states, End note 18. Piracy has been held in the utmost abhorrence, and those guilty of it treated with singular and barbarous severity, and that the most sanguinary laws were established for the protection of person and property in maritime adventure. The laws of Aleron, which were composed under the immediate direction of our Richard I, and became the common usage among maritime states whose vessels passed through British seas, are conceived in a spirit of the most barbarous cruelty. End note 19. Thus, if a poor pilot, through ignorance, lost the vessel, he was either required to make full satisfaction to the merchant for damages sustained, or to lose his head. In the case of Rex, where the lord of the coast, something like our present vice-admiral, should be found to be in league with the pilots and run the ship on the rocks in order to get a salvage, the said lord, the salvers, and all concerned, are declared to be accursed and excommunicated, and punished as thieves and robbers, and the pilot condemned to be hanged upon a high gibbet, which is to abide and remain to succeeding ages, on the place where erected, as a visible caution to other ships sailing thereby. Nor was the fate of the lord of the coast less severe. His property was to be confiscated, and himself fastened to a post in the midst of his own mansion, which, being fired at the four corners, were all to be burned together, the walls thereof demolished, and the spot on which it stood be converted into a market-place, for the sale only of hogs and swine, to all posterity. These and many other barbarous usages were transferred into the institutions of Wisby, 
which formed the jus mercatorum for a long period and in which great care was taken for the security of ships against their crews among other articles are the following whoever draws a sword upon the master of a vessel or wilfully falsifies the compass shall have his right hand nailed to the mast whoever behaves riotously shall be punished by being keel-hauled whoever is guilty of rebellion or mutiny shall be thrown overboard for the suppression of piracy the portuguese in their early intercourse with india had a summary punishment and accompanied it with a terrible example to deter others from the commission of the crime whenever they took a pirate ship they instantly hanged every man carried away the sails rudder and everything that was valuable in the ship and left her to be buffeted about by winds and waves with the carcasses of the criminals dangling from the yards a horrid object of terror to all who might chance to fall in with her even to this day a spice of the laws of oleron still remains in the maritime code of european nations as far as regards mutiny and piracy and a feeling of this kind may have operated on the mind of captain edwards especially as a tendency even to mutiny or mutinous expressions are considered by the usage of the service as justifying the commander of a ship of war to put the offenders in irons besides the treatment of bligh whose admirable conduct under the unparalleled sufferings of himself and all who accompanied him in the open boat had roused the people of england to the highest pitch of indignation against christian and his associates in which edwards no doubt participated the following letter of mr peter haywood to his mother removes all doubt as to the character and conduct of this officer it is an artless and pathetic tale and as his amiable sister says breathes not a syllable inconsistent with truth and honour batavia november twentieth seventeen ninety one my ever honoured and dearest mother at length the time has arrived when you are once more to hear from your ill-fated son whose conduct at the capture of that ship in which it was my fortune to embark has i fear from what has since happened to me been grossly misrepresented to you by lieutenant bligh who by not knowing the real cause of my remaining on board naturally suspected me unhappily for me to be a coadjutor in the mutiny but i never to my knowledge whilst under his command behaved myself in a manner unbecoming the station i occupied nor so much as even entertained a thought derogatory to his honour so as to give him the least grounds for entertaining an opinion of me so ungenerous and undeserved for i flatter myself he cannot give a character of my conduct whilst i was under his tuition that could merit the slightest scrutiny o oh, my dearest mother i hope you have not so easily credited such an account of me do but let me vindicate my conduct and declare to you the true cause of my remaining in the ship and you will then see how little i deserve censure and how i have been injured by so gross an aspersion i shall then give you a short and cursory account of what has happened to me since but i am afraid to say a hundredth part of what i have got in store for i am not allowed the use of writing materials if known so that this is done by stealth and if it should ever come to your hands it will i hope have the desired effect of removing your uneasiness on my account when i assure you before the face of god of my innocence of what is laid to my charge how i came to remain on board was thus the morning the ship was taken it being my watch below happening to awake just after daylight and looking out of my hammock i saw a man sitting upon the arm-chest in the main hatchway with a drawn cutlass in his hand the reason of which i could not divine so i got out of bed and inquired of him what was the cause of it he told me that mr christian assisted by some of the ship's company had seized the captain and put him in confinement had taken the command of the ship and meant to carry bligh home a prisoner in order to try him by court-martial for his long tyrannical and impressive conduct to his people i was quite thunderstruck and hurrying into my berth again told one of my messmates whom i awakened out of his sleep what had happened then dressing myself i went up the fore hatchway and saw what he had told me was but too true and again i asked some of the people who were under arms what was going to be done with the captain who was then on the larboard side of the quarter-deck with his hands tied behind his back and mr christian alongside him with a pistol and drawn bayonet i now heard a very different story and that the captain was to be sent ashore to tufoa in the launch and that those who would not join mr christian might either accompany the captain or would be taken in irons to otaheite and left there the relation of two stories so different left me unable to judge which could be the true one but seeing them hoisting the boats out it seemed to prove the latter in this trying situation young and experienced as i was and without an adviser every person being as it were infatuated and not knowing what to do i remained for a while a silent spectator of what was going on 
and after revolving the matter in my mind, I determined to choose what I thought the lesser of two evils, and stay by the ship, for I had no doubt that those who went on shore in the launch would be put to death by the savage natives, whereas the Otahitans, being a humane and generous race, one might have a hope of being kindly received, and remain there until the arrival of some ship which seemed, to silly me, the most consistent with reason and rectitude. While this resolution possessed my mind, at the same time lending my assistance to hoist out the boats, the hurry and confusion affairs were in, and thinking my intention just, I never thought of going to Mr. Bly for advice. Besides, what confirmed me in it was my seeing two experienced officers, when ordered into the boat by Mr. Christian, desire his permission to remain in the ship, one of whom, my own messmate, Mr. Hayward, and I being assisting to clear the launch of yams, he asked me what I intended to do. I told him to remain in the ship. Now this answer I imagine he has told Mr. Bly I made to him, from which, together with my not speaking to him that morning, his suspicions of me have arisen, construing my conduct into what is foreign to my nature. Thus, my dearest mother, it was all owing to my youth and unadvised inexperience, but has been interpreted into villainy and disregard of my country's laws, the ill effects of which I at present, and still am to, labour under for some months longer. And now, after what I have asserted, I may still once more retrieve my injured reputation, be again reinstated in the affection and favour of the most tender of mothers, and be still considered as her ever-dutiful son. I was not undeceived in my erroneous decision till too late, which was after the captain was in the launch, for while I was talking to the master-at-arms, one of the ringleaders in the affair, my other messmate, whom I had left in his hammock in the berth, Mr. Stewart, came up to me and asked me if I was not going in the launch. I replied no, upon which he told me not to think of such a thing as remaining behind, but take his advice and go down below with him to get a few necessary things and make haste to go with him into the launch, adding that, by remaining in the ship, I should incur an equal share of guilt with the mutineers themselves. I reluctantly followed his advice. I say reluctantly, because I knew no better, and was foolish. And the boat swimming very deep in the water, the land being far distant, the thoughts of being sacrificed by the natives, and the self-consciousness of my first intention being just, all these considerations almost staggered my resolution. However, I preferred my companion's judgment to my own, and we both jumped down the main hatchway to prepare ourselves for the boat, but no sooner were we in the berth than the master-at-arms ordered the sentry to keep us both in the berth till he should receive orders to release us. We desired the master-at-arms to acquaint Mr. Bly of our intention, which we had reason to think he never did, nor were we permitted to come on deck until the launch was a long way astern. I now, when too late, saw my error. At the latter end of May we got to an island to the southward of Tahiti, called Tubuai, where they intended to make a settlement, but finding no stock there of any kind, they agreed to go to Tahiti, and after procuring hogs and fowls, to return to Tabua and remain. So, on the 6th of June, we arrived at Tahiti, where I was in hopes I might find an opportunity of running away and remaining on shore, but I could not effect it, as there was always too good a lookout, kept to prevent any such steps being taken. And besides, they had all sworn that should any one make his escape, they would force the natives to restore him, and would then shoot him as an example to the rest. Well knowing that any one by remaining there might be the means, should a ship arrive, of discovering their intended place of abode. Finding it therefore impracticable, I saw no other alternative but to rest as content as possible, and return to Tabuai, and there wait till the mass of bounty should be taken out, and then take the boat which might carry me to Tahiti, and disable those remaining from pursuit. End note 20. But Providence so ordered it, that we had no occasion to try our fortune at such a hazard, for, upon returning there, and remaining till the latter end of August, in which time a fort was almost built, but nothing could be effected, and as the natives could not be brought to friendly terms, and with whom we had many skirmishes and narrow escapes from being cut off by them, and, what was still worse, internal broils and discontent, these things determined part of the people to leave the island and go to Tahiti, which was carried by a majority of votes. This being carried into execution on the 22nd of September, and being anchored in Matayai Bay, the next morning my messmate Mr. Stewart and I went on shore to the house of an old landed proprietor, our former friend, and being now set free from a lawless crew, determined to remain as much apart from them as possible, and wait patiently for the arrival of a ship. 
fourteen more of the bounty's people came likewise on shore and mr christian and eight men went away with the ship but god knows whither whilst we remained here we were treated by our kind and friendly natives with a generosity and humanity almost unparalleled and such as we could hardly have expected from the most civilized people to be brief having remained here till the latter end of march seventeen ninety one on the twenty sixth of that month his majesty's ship pandora arrived and had scarcely anchored when my messmate and i went on board and made ourselves known and having learnt from one of the natives who had been off in a canoe that our former messmate mr hayward now promoted to the rank of lieutenant was on board we asked for him supposing he might prove the assertions of our innocence but he like all worldlings when raised a little in life received us very coolly and pretended ignorance of our affairs yet formerly he and i were bound in brotherly love and friendship appearances being so much against us we were ordered to be put in irons and looked upon oh infernal words as piratical villains a rebuff so severe as this was to a person unused to troubles would perhaps have been unsupportable but to me who had now been long inured to the frowns of fortune and feeling myself supported by an inward consciousness of not deserving it it was received with the greatest composure and a full determination to bear it with patience my sufferings however i have not power to describe but though they are great yet i thank god for enabling me to bear them without repining i endeavour to qualify my affliction with these three considerations first my innocence not deserving them secondly that they cannot last long and thirdly that the change may be for the better the first improves my hope the second my patience and the third my courage i am young in years but old in what the world calls adversity and it has had such an effect as to make me consider it the most beneficial incident that could have occurred at my age it has made me acquainted with three things which are little known and as little believed by any but those who have felt their effects first the villainy and censoriousness of mankind secondly the futility of all human hopes and thirdly the happiness of being content in whatever station it may please providence to place me in in short it has made me more of a philosopher than many years of a life spent in ease and pleasure would have done as they will no doubt proceed to the greatest lengths against me i being the only surviving officer and they most inclined to believe a prior story all that can be said to confute it will probably be looked upon as mere falsity and invention should that be my unhappy case and they resolve upon my destruction as an example to futurity may god enable me to bear my fate with the fortitude of a man conscious that misfortune not any misconduct is the cause and that the almighty can attest my innocence yet why should i despond i have i hope still a friend in that providence which hath preserved me amidst many greater dangers and upon whom alone i now depend for safety god will always protect those who deserve it these are the sole considerations which have enabled me to make myself easy and content under my past misfortunes Twelve more of the people who were at Otaheite having delivered themselves up, there was a sort of prison built on the after part of the quarter-deck into which we were all put in close confinement with both legs and both hands in irons, and were treated with great rigour, not being allowed ever to get out of this den, and being obliged to eat, drink, sleep, and obey the calls of nature here. You may form some idea of the disagreeable situation I must have been in, unable as I was to help myself, being deprived of the use of both my legs and hands, but by no means adequate to the reality. On the ninth of May we left Otaheite and proceeded to the friendly islands, and about the beginning of August got in amongst the reefs of New Holland to endeavour to discover a passage through them, but it was not effected, for the Pandora, ever unlucky, and as if devoted by heaven to destruction, was driven by a current upon the patch of a reef, and on which, there being a heavy surf, she was soon almost bulged to pieces but having thrown all the guns on one side overboard and the tide flowing at the same time she beat over the reef into a basin and brought up in fourteen or fifteen fathoms but she was so much damaged while on the reef that imagining she would go to pieces every moment we had contrived to wrench ourselves out of our irons and applied to the captain to have mercy on us and suffer us to take our chance for the preservation of our lives but it was all in vain he was even so inhuman as to order us all to be put in irons again, though the ship was expected to go down every moment, being scarcely able to keep her under with all the pumps at work. In this miserable situation, with an expected death before our eyes, without the least hope of relief, 
and in the most trying state of suspense we spent the night, the ship being by the hand of Providence kept up till the morning. The boats by this time had all been prepared, and as the captain and officers were coming upon the poop or roof of our prison to abandon the ship, the water being then up to the combings of the hatchways, we again implored his mercy, upon which he sent the corporal and an armourer down to let some of us out of irons, but three only were suffered to go up, and the scuttle being then clapped on, and the master-at-arms upon it, the armourer had only time to let two persons out of irons, the rest, except three, letting themselves out. Two of these three went down with them on their hands, and the third was picked up. She now began to heel over to port so very much, that the master-at-arms sliding overboard, and leaving the scuttle vacant, we all tried to get up, and I was at last out but three. The water was then pouring in at the bulkhead scuttles, yet I succeeded in getting out, and was scarcely in the sea when I could see nothing above it but the cross-trees, and nothing around me but a scene of the greatest distress. I took a plank, being stark naked, and swam towards an island about three miles off, but was picked up on my passage by one of the boats. When we got ashore to the small sandy quay, we found there were thirty-four men drowned, four of whom were prisoners, and among these was my unfortunate messmate Mr. Stewart. Ten of us, and eighty-nine of the Pandora's crew, were saved. When a survey was made of what provisions had been saved, they were found to consist of two or three bags of bread, two or three beakers of water, and a little wine. So we subsisted three days upon two wine glasses of water, and two ounces of bread per day. On the 1st of September we left the island, and on the 16th arrived at Kupang on the island of Timor, having been on short allowance eighteen days. We were put in confinement in the castle, where we remained till October, and on the 5th of that month we were sent on board a Dutch ship bound for Batavia. Though I have been eight months in close confinement in a hot climate, I have kept my health in a most surprising manner, without the least indisposition, and am still perfectly well in every respect, in mind as well as body, but without a friend and only a shirt and a pair of trousers to put on and carry me home. Yet with all this I have a contented mind, entirely resigned to the will of Providence, which conduct alone enables me to soar above the reach of unhappiness. In a subsequent letter to his sister, he says, I send you two little sketches of the manner in which His Majesty's ship Pandora went down on the 29th of August, and of the appearance which we who survived made on the small sandy quay within the reef, about ninety yards long and sixty broad, in all ninety-nine souls. Here we remained three days, subsisting on a single wine-glass of wine or water, and two ounces of bread a day, with no shelter from the meridian and then vertical sun. Captain Edwards had tents erected for himself and his people, and we prisoners petitioned him for an old sail which was lying useless, part of the wreck, but he refused it, and the only shelter we had was to bury ourselves up to the neck in the burning sand, which scorched the skin entirely off our bodies, for we were quite naked, and we appeared as if dipped in large tubs of boiling water. We were nineteen days in the same miserable situation before we landed at Kupang. I was in the ship in irons, hands and feet, much longer than till the position you now see her in, the poop alone being above the water, and that knee-deep, when a kind of providence assisted me to get out of irons and escape from her. End of chapter 5, part 2 Recording by Haley Flagg of Texas Chapter 5 the Pandora, Part Three, of the eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of HMS Bounty, its cause and consequences. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Haley Flag. The eventful history of the mutiny and piratical seizure of HMS Bounty by Sir John Barrow. Chapter 5, Part 3. The treatment of these unhappy men was almost as bad at Batavia as in the Pandora, being closely confined in irons in the castle, and fed on very bad provisions. And the hardships they endured on their passage to England in Dutch ships were very severe, having, as he says, slept on nothing but hard boards on wet canvas, without any bed, for seventeen months, always subsisting on short allowance of execrable provisions, 
and without any clothes for some time, except such as the charity of two young men in the ship supplied him with. He had during his confinement at Batavia learned to make straw hats, and finished several with both his hands and fetters, which he sold for half a crown apiece, and with the produce of these he procured a suit of coarse clothes, in which, with a cheerful and light heart, notwithstanding all his sufferings, he arrived at Portsmouth. How he preserved his health under the dreadful sufferings he endured, and in eight months close confinement in a hot climate, is quite wonderful. On the second day after the arrival of the Gorgon at Spithead, the prisoners were transferred to the Hector, commanded by Captain, the late Admiral Sir George Montague, where they were treated with the greatest humanity, and every indulgence allowed that could with propriety be extended to men in their unhappy situation, until the period when they were to be arraigned before the competent authority, and put on their trials for mutiny and piracy, which did not take place until the month of September. In this period of anxious and awful suspense, a most interesting correspondence was carried on between this unfortunate youth and his numerous friends, which exhibits the character of himself and the whole family in the most amiable and affectionate colours, and in a more particular manner, of that adorable creature his sister Nessie, who in one of her letters accounts for the peculiar warmth of her attachment and expressions by their being nearly of the same age, and engaged in the same pursuits, whether of study or amusement in their juvenile years. The poor mother, on hearing of his arrival, thus addresses her unfortunate son. Isle of Man, June twenty ninth, 1792 Oh, my ever dearly beloved and long-lost son, with what anxiety have I waited for this period! I have counted the days, hours, and even minutes since I first heard of the horrid and unfortunate mutiny which has so long deprived me of my dearest boy. But now the happy time is come when, though I cannot have the unspeakable pleasure of seeing and embracing you, yet I hope we may be allowed to correspond. Surely there can be nothing improper in a liberty of this sort between an affectionate mother and her dutiful and beloved son, who, I am perfectly convinced, was never guilty of the crime he has been suspected of by those who did not know his worth and truth. I have not the least doubt but that the all-gracious God— who of his good providence has protected you so long, and brought you safe through so many dangers and difficulties, will still protect you, and at your trial make your innocence appear as clear as the light. All your letters have come safe to me, and to my very dear good Nessie. Ah, Peter, with what real joy did we all receive them, and how happy are we that you are now safe in England! I will endeavour, my dearest lad, to make your present situation as comfortable as possible, for so affectionate and good a son deserves my utmost attention. Nessie has written to our faithful and kind friend, Mr. Haywood, of Plymouth, for his advice, whether it would be proper for her to come up to you. If he consents to her so doing, not a moment shall be lost, and how happy shall I be when she is with you. Such a sister as she is, oh, Peter, she is a most valuable girl, etc. On the same day, this most valuable girl thus writes, End note 21. My dearest and most beloved brother, thanks to that almighty providence which has so miraculously preserved you, your fond, anxious, and till now miserable Nessie is at last permitted to address the object of her tenderest affection in England. Oh, my admirable, my heroic boy, what have we felt on your account? Yet how small, how infinitely trifling was the misery of our situation when compared with the horror of yours! Let me now, however, with confidence, hope that the God of all mercies has not so long protected you in vain, but will at length crown your fortitude and pious resignation to his will with that peace and happiness you so richly merit. How blessed did your delightful and yet dreadful letter from Batavia make us all! Surely, my beloved boy, you could not for a moment imagine we ever supposed you guilty of the crime of mutiny. No, no, believe me, no earthly power could have persuaded us that it was possible for you to do anything inconsistent with strict honour and duty. So well did we know your amiable, steady principles, that we were assured your reasons for staying behind would turn out such as you represent them, and I firmly trust that Providence will at length restore you to those dear and affectionate friends who can know no happiness until they are blessed with your loved society." Take care of your precious health, my angelic boy. I shall soon be with you. 
I have written to Mr. Haywood, your and our excellent friend and protector, for his permission to go to you immediately, which my uncle Haywood, without first obtaining it, would not allow, fearing lest any precipitate step might injure you at present, and I only wait the arrival of his next letter to fly into your arms. Oh, my best beloved Peter, how I anticipate the rapture of that moment! For, alas, I have no joy, no happiness, but in your beloved society, and no hopes, no fears, no wishes, but for you. Mr. Haywood's sisters all address their unfortunate brother in the same affectionate but less impassioned strain, and a little trait of good feeling is mentioned, on the part of an old female servant, that shows what a happy and attached family the Haywoods were, previous to the melancholy affair in which their boy became entangled. Mrs. Haywood says, "'My good, honest Burke, it is very well,' and says your safe return has made her more happy than she has been for these two and forty years she has been in our family. And Miss Nessie tells him, Poor Burkett, the most faithful and worthiest of servants, desires me to tell you that she almost dies with joy at the thought of your safe arrival in England. What agony, my dear boy, has she felt on your account? Her affection for you knows no bounds, and her misery has indeed been extreme, but she still lives to bless your virtues." The poor prisoner thus replies, from his majesty's ship Hector, to his beloved sisters all, "'This day I had the supreme happiness of your long-expected letters, and I am not able to express the pleasure and joy they afforded me. At the sight of them my spirits, low and dejected, were at once exhilarated. My heart had long and greatly suffered from my impatience to hear of those most dear to me, and was tossed and tormented by the storms of fearful conjecture.' but they are now subsided, and my bosom has at length attained that long-lost serenity and calmness it once enjoyed. For you may believe me when I say it never yet has suffered any disquiet from my own misfortunes, but from a truly anxious solicitude for, and desire to hear of, your welfare. God be thanked, you still entertain such an opinion of me as I will flatter myself I have deserved, but why do I say so? Can I make myself too worthy the affectionate praises of such amiable sisters? Oh, my Nessie, it grieves me to think I must be under the necessity, however heart-breaking to myself, of desiring you will relinquish your most affectionate design of coming to see me. It is too long and tedious a journey, and even on your arrival you would not be allowed the wished-for happiness, both to you and myself, of seeing, much less conversing with, your unfortunate brother." The rules of the service are so strict that prisoners are not permitted to have any communication with female relations, thus even the sight of, and conversation with, so truly affectionate a sister is for the present denied me. The happiness of such an interview let us defer till a time which, please God, will arrive, when it can be enjoyed with more freedom and unobserved by the gazing eyes of an inquisitive world, which in my present place of confinement would of course not be the case." I am very happy to hear that poor old Burkett is still alive. Remember me to her, and tell her not to heave her back until God grants me the pleasure of seeing her. And now, my dear Nessie, cease to anticipate the happiness of personal communication with your poor but resigned brother, until wished-for freedom removes the indignant shackles I now bear, from the feet of your fond and most affectionate brother, P. H. In a subsequent letter to his sister, he says, Let us at present be resigned to our fate, contented with this sort of communication, and be thankful to God for having even allowed us that happiness. For be assured the present confinement is liberty, compared with what it has been for the fifteen months last past. On the 15th of July, Commodore Paisley addressed the following business-like letter to Miss Haywood. I received your letter, my dearest Nessie, with the enclosure, her brother's narrative, but did not choose to answer it until I had made a thorough investigation, that is, seen personally all the principal evidences which has ever since occupied my whole thoughts and time. I have also had some letters from himself, and notwithstanding he must still continue in confinement, every attention and indulgence possible is granted him by Captain Montague of the Hector, who is my particular friend. I have no doubt of the truth of your brother's narrative. The master, boatswain, Gunner and Carpenter, late of the bounty, I have seen, and have the pleasure to assure you that they are all favourable and corroborate what he says. That fellow, Captain Edwards, whose inhuman rigour of confinement I shall never forget, I have likewise seen. He cannot deny that Peter avowed himself late of the bounty when he came voluntarily aboard. This is a favourable circumstance. 
I have been at the Admiralty, and read over all the dispositions taken and sent home by Bly and his officers from Batavia, likewise the court-martial on himself, in none of which appears anything against Peter. As soon as Lieutenant Haywood arrives with the remainder of the Pandora's crew, the court-martial is to take place. I shall certainly attend, and we must have an able counsellor to assist, for I will not deceive you, my dear Nessie, however favourable circumstances may appear, our martial law is severe. By the tenor of it, the man who stands neuter is equally guilty with him who lifts his arm against his captain in such cases. His extreme youth and his delivering himself up are the strong points of his defence. Adieu, my dearest Nessie. Present my love to your mother and sisters, and rest assured of my utmost exertions to extricate your brother. Your affectionate uncle, T. Paisley. This excellent man did not stop here. Knowing that sea officers have a great aversion from counsel, he writes to say, A friend of mine, Mr. Graham, who has been secretary to the different admirals on the Newfoundland station for these twelve years, and consequently has acted as judge advocate at court-martials all that time, has offered me to attend you. He has a thorough knowledge of the service, uncommon abilities, and is a very good lawyer. He has already had most of the evidences with him. Adieu, my young friend. Keep up your spirits, and rest assured I shall be watchful for your good. My heart will be more at ease if I can get my friend Graham to go down than if you were attended by the first counsel in England. End note 22. Mr. Graham accordingly attended, and was of the greatest service at the trial. Nessie Haywood, end note 23, having in one of her letters inquired of her brother how tall he was, and having received information on this point, expressed some surprise that he was not taller. And so, he replies, you are surprised I am not taller. Ah, oh, Nessie, let me ask you this. Suppose the two last years of your growth had been retarded by close confinement, nearly deprived of all kinds of necessary element, shut up from the all-cheering light of the sun for the space of five months, and never suffered to breathe the fresh air, an enjoyment which Providence denies to none of his creatures, during all that time, and without any kind of exercise to stretch and supple your limbs, besides many other inconveniences which I will not pain you by mentioning. How tall should you have been, my dear sister? Answer, four feet nothing. But enough of nonsense. Nessie Haywood had expressed a strong desire to see her brother, but was told the rules of the service would not allow it. Also, that it would agitate him, when he sought to be cool and collected, to meet his approaching trial. That was quite enough. But as for myself, she says, no danger, no fatigue, no difficulties would deter me. I have youth and health and excellent natural spirits. These and the strength of my affection would support me through it all. If I were not allowed to see you, yet being in the same place which contains you, would be joy inexpressible. I will not, however, any longer desire it, but will learn to imitate your fortitude and patience. Mr. Haywood of Maristow and his daughter, Mrs. Bertie, had intimated the same thing. These excellent people, from the moment of young Haywood's arrival, had shown him every kindness, supplied him with money, and, what was better, with friends, who could give him the best advice. To this worthy lady, Miss Nessie Haywood thus addresses herself. Overwhelmed with sensations of gratitude and pleasure which she is too much agitated to express, permit me, dearest madam, at my mamma's request, to offer you her and our most sincere acknowledgments for your invaluable letter, which, from the detention of the packet, she did not receive till yesterday. By a letter from my beloved brother, of the same date, we are informed that Mr. Larkham, who I suppose to be the gentleman you mention having sent to see him, has been on board the Hector, and has kindly offered him the most salutary advice relative to his present situation, for which allow me to request you will present him our best thanks. He also speaks with every expression a grateful heart can dictate of your excellent father's goodness in providing for all his wants, even before he could have received any letters from us to that purpose. Ah, my dear madam, how truly characteristic is this of kind friendship with which he has ever honoured our family. But my beloved Peter does not know that Mr. Haywood has a daughter whose generosity is equal to his own, and whose amiable compassion for his sufferings it will be as impossible for us to forget as it is to express the admiration and gratitude it has inspired. It would, I am convinced, be unnecessary, as well as a very bad compliment to you, madam, were I to presume to point out anything particular to be done for our poor boy, as I have not the least doubt your goodness and kind intention have long ago rendered every care of that sort on our part unnecessary. 
I shall only add that my mamma begs every wish he forms may be granted, and sure I am, he will not desire a single gratification that can be deemed in the smallest degree improper. In one of my brother's letters, dated the 23rd, he hints that he shall not be permitted to see any of his relations till his trial is over, and that he therefore does not expect us. I have, however, written to Mr. Haywood, without whose approbation I would by no means take any step, for permission to go to him. If it is absolutely impossible for me to see him, though in the presence of witnesses, yet even that prohibition, cruel as it is, I could bear with patience, provided I might be near him, to see the ship in which he at present exists, to behold those objects which, perhaps at the same moment, attracts his notice, to breathe the same air which he breathes. My dearest madam, these are inestimable gratifications, and will convey sensations of rapture and delight to the fond bosom of a sister, which it is far, very far, beyond my power to describe. Besides, the anxiety and impatience produced by the immense distance which now separates us from him, and the uncertainty attending the packet, render it difficult and sometimes impossible to hear of him so often as we would wish and, may I not add, though heaven in its mercy forbid it, for, alas, the bare idea is too dreadful, yet it is in the scale of possibility, that some accident might happen to deprive us of my dearest brother. How insupportably bitter would then be our reflections, for, having omitted the opportunity, when it was in our power, of administering comfort and consolation to him in person. For these reasons, I earnestly hope Mr. Haywood will not judge it improper to comply with my request, and shall wait with eager impatience the arrival of his next letter. Think not, my dear madam, that it is want of confidence in your care and attention which makes me solicitous to be with my beloved brother. Be assured we are all as perfectly easy in that respect as if we were on the spot, but I am convinced you will pardon the dictates of an affection which an absence of five years, rendered still more painful by his sufferings, has heightened almost to a degree of adoration. I shall, with your permission, take the liberty of enclosing a letter to my brother, which I leave open for perusal, and at the same time request your pardon for mentioning you to him, in such terms as I am apprehensive will wound the delicacy which ever accompanies generosity like yours. But indeed, my dearest madam, I cannot, must not, suffer my beloved boy to remain in ignorance of that worth and excellence which has prompted you to become his kind protectress." I have the honour to be, with every sentiment of gratitude, etc., 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 Nessie Haywood. Among the numerous friends that interested themselves in the fate of this unhappy youth was his uncle, Colonel Hallwell. The testimony he bears to his excellent character is corroborated by all who knew him while a boy at home. About a fortnight before the trial, he writes to him thus, 21st of August, 1792. My very dear Peter, I have this day received yours of the 18th, and am happy to find by its contents that, notwithstanding your long and cruel confinement, you still preserve your health and write in good spirits. Preserve it, my dear boy, awful as the approaching period must be, even to the most innocent, but from which all who know you have not a doubt of your rising as immaculate as a newborn infant. I have known you from your cradle, and have often remarked with pleasure and surprise the many assiduous instances, far beyond your years, you have given a filial duty and paternal affection to the best of parents, and to brothers and sisters, who doted on you. Your education has been the best, and from these considerations alone, without the very clear evidence of your own testimony, I would as soon believe the Archbishop of Canterbury would set fire to the City of London, as suppose you could, directly or indirectly, join in such an absurd piece of business. Truly sorry am I that my state of health will not permit me to go down to Portsmouth to give this testimony publicly before that respectable tribunal where your country's laws have justly ordained you must appear. But consider this as the touchstone, my dear boy, by which your worth must be known. Six years in the navy myself, and twenty-eight years a soldier, I flatter myself my judgment will not prove erroneous. That power, my dear Peter, of whose grace and mercy you seem to have so just a sense, will not now forsake you. Your dear aunt is, as must be expected, in such a trying situation, but more from your present sufferings than any apprehension of what is to follow, etc. With similar testimonies and most favourable auguries from Commodore Paisley, the Reverend Dr. Scott of the Isle of Man, and others, young Haywood went to his long and anxiously expected trial, which took place on the 12th of September, and continued to the 18th of that month. Mrs. Haywood had been anxious that Erskine and Mingay should be employed as counsel, 
but Mr. Graham, whom Commodore Paisley had so highly recommended, gave his best assistance, as did also Mr. Const, who had been retained, for which the Commodore expresses his sorrow, as sea officers, he says, have great aversion to lawyers. Mr. Peter Haywood assigns a better reason. In a letter to his sister Mary, he says that counsel to a naval prisoner is of no effect, and as they are not allowed to speak, their eloquence is not of the least efficacy. I request, therefore, you will desire my dear mother to revoke the letter she has been so good to write, to retain Mr. Erskine and Mr. Mingay, and to forbear putting herself to so great and needless an expense, from which no good can accrue. No, no, Mary, it is not the same as a trial on shore. It would then be highly requisite, but in this case I, alone, must fight my own battle. And I think my telling the truth undisguised, in a plain, short, and concise manner, is as likely to be deserving the victory as the most elaborate eloquence of a Cicero upon the same subject. At this anxious moment many painfully interesting letters passed to and from the family in the Isle of Man. The last letter from his beloved Nessie, previous to the awful event, thus concludes, May that almighty providence, whose tender care has hitherto preserved you, be still your powerful protector. May he instill into the hearts of your judges every sentiment of justice, generosity, and compassion. May hope, innocence, and integrity be your firm support, and liberty, glory, and honour your just reward. May all good angels guard you from even the appearance of danger, and may you at length be restored to us, the delight, the pride of your adoring friends, and the sole happiness and felicity of that fond heart which animates the bosom of my dear Peter's most faithful and truly affectionate sister. In H. End of chapter 5, part 3. Recording by Haley Flagg of Texas.